will uh, get going. Okay, so um, uh, I actually have two sets of slides for uh, today, and I, I will work to, uh, to post those. I was hoping to do so, but, uh, but prior to this lecture, um, and forgive me for not having, uh, for having run out of time for that. The two sets of materials uh, lie on uh, sort of introducing the syntax and semantics, as it were, associated with the diagrams, and some comments on, on metadata, um, with so much of the course being about data science. Um, uh, you may be surprised uh, to hear that um, uh, I think there's an essential need to discuss a little bit of metadata uh, about such models, because that metadata shapes the uh, structure of the um, the state space of these models, and uh, thereby the effectiveness of data science techniques. Uh, it also relates to the feasibility of performing some of the major tasks we'll be discussing in this class, like uh, calibration and uh, and MCMC and approximate patient computation and PMCMC, uh, which um, uh, which use uh, parameter space, um, in which parameter spaces uh, feature largely, and the dimensional, uh, the notions of dimensions and units that I'll be introducing will bear on uh, reducing the dimensionality of that parameter space as well. So we'll be having some basics here, and then. Um, I will uh, hope to cover at least opening slides of um, some material very specifically on, on uh, the implications of nonlinearity and introducing kind of canonical forms uh, or very typical forms of, um, of infectious disease modeling that you'll find in the literature and past applications. Oops, I'm on the second, second uh, example there, uh, second set of slides. So here we go. Um, so uh, I mentioned uh, the need to introduce metadata, um, and the metadata that I want to introduce um, involves dimensions and units. Uh, this is a recurrent theme to which I will come back. It's a theme that whose importance in me was instilled by starting my professional work with modeling in the uh, in 1990. Um, embedded in a team of computational physicists uh, using simulation to understand um, predominantly physical phenomena uh, at MIT. And um, physicists routinely make heavy use of, of dimensions and models. Um, uh, a major tradition of modeling uh, to which I've contributed um, over decades also, system dynamics modeling, tends to make heavy use of dimensions. But I found that in many spheres of modeling, including many quarters of infectious disease modeling, there's less attention paid um, to the detriment of some insights that can come from that modeling. Um, so uh, I'm going to be recurrently coming back to this issue of dimensions, um, which I hope will both shed clearer light on some of the examples um, help uh, prevent needless missteps when it comes to analyzing some of the data and, um, and which will uh, exhibit implications for, for the behavior of these systems. So um, the ideas here are simple, um, uh, intuitive, but often in many of us tacit um, rather than being explicit. So when we build models, we're characterizing a uh, phenomenon in the world um, and our models at some level mimic um, at an abstract level, um, certain phenomena, certain processes in the world. And when we're characterizing our models, um, in addition to characterizing uh, sets of, of say differential equations, which describe them, um, uh, each of which at any one time when running the model, um, maybe a, a given state variable or stock will be associated with a given count. Uh, we want to as associate and label each component of that model with unique dimensions that describe the type of, of, um, of thing that, that uh, each uh, state variable is describing. So maybe some state variables describe counts of people. Uh, others describe counts of, um, of doses of vaccine. Um, that have been administered or are waiting to be administered. 
maybe others yet characterize cumulative counts of infections that have occurred. Um, these are dealing with different types of quantities and uh, it, it's extraordinarily useful um, for at least five different reasons um, to delineate when we de describe the model to delineate uh, unambiguously the nature of that information, the semantic category, the dimension associated with each variable in a model. Um, I've given a list of dimensions here. Um, you'll notice that they are describing a whole category of things, time. I'm not going into whether we're measuring it in days or weeks or, or years, that will be units. Here, we're just saying it's, it, we're, it's time. Um, so, you know, we are, um, we have a variable that describes the mean time until recovery from infection. Uh, or maybe we're dealing with uh, length, um, a unit of length, meaning, you know, something like meters or, or um, miles. We're, we're abstracting over that. We're just saying this captures length. Um, and uh, the important thing is these dimensions are independent of, of any measure. It's not that they define a, a meter stick or yard stick, um, uh, far from it. They describe instead the semantic type associated with a, a given quantity. And for a given dimensional labeling of a model, a, a specific quantity will have a unique dimension. Um, and one doesn't convert typically between these dimensions. One doesn't say, oh, we're gonna turn a time into a length or something, or um, you know, a length into a person. Um, these are, are very semantically uh, different quantities of, or different um, spheres of, of um, concern, and they can't be converted into one another. Accompanying dimensions though, accompanying each dimension are uh, one or more types of units. So for example, time, we might have, we might seek to measure time, um, things of dimension time in seconds, weeks, or centuries, um, or length in meters or fathoms or furlongs or angstroms. Um, so units, um, there can be one or more set of units for a given dimension. And uh, units have to do with the, the yardstick or meter stick we use to, to characterize how much of a dimension we have. Um, uh, so it describes kind of um, the reference used um, in performing a particular measurement or, or um, a characterization of quantity. Uh, it does always relate to a particular dimension. You know, seconds is something about time. It's not a quantity for length, for example. Um, and, uh, you know, there's dimensional constants when we transition between units. So if we're going from feet to inches, we divide by 12. Uh, if we're going from meters to centimeters, um, uh, excuse me, uh, we multiply by 12. So two feet would be 24 inches. And meters to centimeters, we multiply by 100. Um, and uh, centimeters to meters, multiply by 0.01. Um, so uh, a given quantity in a model has a unique dimension, but but could be described with many units. You know, we might we might characterize that, you know, uh, probably density of recovering from infection, that hazard rate of recovering from infection, um, either as a probability per day or a probability per week or a probability per hour um, or probability per year. Uh, we we choose what yardstick we want to use to measure it. Um, and uh, it is notable that even dimensionless quantities uh, can have units. So something like uh, uh, an angle, for example, may be dimensionless, but we can measure it in radians or degrees. Um, so um, I, I don't want to belabor, belabor this point, but when we're dealing with models, a lot of quantities that we typically deal with um, can be uh, very fruitfully labeled uh, using both dimensions more foundationally and units um, to prevent numerical errors. And for those who may not appreciate the significance of this, um, uh, I will just note there's five major gains that, that come for this, um, uh, some of which uh, have huge implications for model performance, such as creating 
scaled scaled down versions of agent based models where you can simulate with 100,000 people something that you might otherwise would think would require an agent population of tens of millions and relate those two in principled ways. But it can also do things like um, at, a, at a simpler level, like prevent, numer uh, prevent errors in our reasoning, um, doing something silly like adding people to people per unit time, or um, uh, can also help us reduce the, um, uh, the number of parameters we need to calibrate for a model. So units and dimensions will accompany us. And this next little discussion of model structure will employ some of that terminology to hopefully make sure we're on the same page with, with understanding uh, the structure of these models. So I'm gonna be introducing at once here uh, a diagrammatic convention for representing models using this technique, uh, which is often called system structure diagrams and system dynamics. Um, but I'm also going to be discussing some of the uh, foundational quantities we'll be dealing with here and which will play a really big role in the communicable disease area when it comes to transmission modeling. Talking about state variables or stocks and talking about flows between them. Um, so state variables um, called stocks within the system dynamics tradition or levels or compartments. Uh, we commonly refer to compartmental modeling, for example, for transmission modeling. Um, these represent accumulations. They, and collectively, they capture the state of the system, um, hence their name. Um, uh, they can be measured at any one point in time. We could you know, freeze the system at a given time and, and go through and count the number of people who are susceptible, infectious, or recovered right now. Um, and uh, we would have a, a well-defined quantity of people in each of those states. Um, state variables start with an initial value and are changed thereafter only by flows into and out of them. So a state variable has an initial value, an initial condition, as we might call it in, in a numerical computing. And uh, thereon, um, from then on, it will evolve according to um, transitions in or flows in, flows out, the net flow that drives it. Um, there, there are important source of, um, uh, of delay within systems, inertia within systems, uh, and uh, play a very big role within infectious disease modeling, explaining why we get oscillations. and for example, around an endemic equilibrium. Um, why uh, it takes, um, for example, the immune system time to build up defense after an initial infection by a bug or the public health system to build up a defense after initial infection by a, a pathogen in an outbreak. Um, so in stock and flow diagrams, I'm going to illustrate these using uh, rectangles. Um, in each state variable, each of these, these uh, state variables or stocks is associated with a, a given dimension. Whoa, sorry. Here are persons, persons, and persons, but here um, uh, a cumulative number uh, of people. This is um, you know, an accumulation over, over time, which is uh, occurring. Um, and you know, these uh, quantities are, are all around us. Um, at you know, a, a most intuitive level, we think about water in a bathtub as an example of a stock uh, or the count at any one time of susceptible immune people or count of healthcare workers, uh, count of cumulative infections or deaths or tests administered or vaccines administered or, or dollars spent or what have you. Um, and stockpiled doses of vaccines might be another quantity. Um, now, uh, any, any given state variable here, any given stock will have a, a clear dimension. Um, and uh, to give it a numeric value, we'd associate it with a unit as well. Uh, for people, you know, we, we normally measure uh, particular persons and one in principle, one could, could mean use one to mean 100,000 people, but uh, generally speaking in our models, we use one to be one person. Whereas in dollars, we might have a different convention um, uh, than that. Okay, um, so I, I noticed, uh, I noted, you know, some of the features that, that state variables play. Um, 
I want to go on to talk about flows. There are these other things that that knit together the stocks. The stocks are the state variables are kind of the nouns, the the um, flows are the verbs. They're where the action is. Um, they're where the change is, and they're also called fluxes or transitions or somewhat confusingly rates um, or derivatives or differentials. They're their component of uh, a given flow is a component of the derivatives of the associated stock or, or the, the differentials of those stocks. And all change um, to state variables occurs with flows. Um, the state variables have an initial value, but thereafter they are driven by these flows. Um, so uh, infectious is drained by this flow of, of people recovering and it's built up by this flow of new infections. Um, and uh, importantly, the flows um, have, a, have a dimension that, that uh, invariably is per unit time, uh, per, per time. And the time is in the denominator. And, um, and uh, flows into and out of that, um, you know, if, if the, excuse me, um, if we have a stock, uh, a state variables whose dimension is of type X, the flows into and out of that stock have to be have to have dimension x over time, um, uh, and unit uh, you know say uh, x over some unit of, of time. Uh, maybe it's year or month or day. So uh, from a, a given stock, we can immediately uh, derive what the units of the flows are, and indeed the units of any connected set of stocks. Um, uh, you know, along a chain, have all have to have the same dimensions, the same units, and, as do the flows along that chain. Uh, now, in contrast to stocks, which, if you freeze time, can be measured, you know, at any one time, um, flows are measured over a certain period of time. So we talk about infections per week, or infections per month, or infections per day. We talk about reported cases per day. We talk about deaths per day or deaths per, per year or what have you. Um, and we typically measure them over a, a, a period of time. Um, so, you know, we, if we want to know what's the early incidence of, of uh, measles uh, within our province, we count up how many measles cases there were on a per year basis, right? Um, and, uh, and yet, at any one time, um, you know, we, we say the flow has a certain rate at which it's going, 10 people per day, say. Um, but at a as a practical measure to measure it, as a practical matter to measure it, we, we, we typically, you know, count these things up over time. So, um, you know, we, if we think back to our notion of flows in a, in a uh, bathtub, you know, we have flows in and flows out, which might be liters per minute. Um, uh, in in terms of infectious disease modeling, we'll have uh, incident cases, right? And people per month, um, uh, people recovering per month, um, vaccines administered per day, um, mortality people per, per year, for example, or, or treatment people per day or what have you. Um, so flows um, are also all around us. Um, and you can often spot them by you know, they're an amount per un per time or some unit time if you're talking about units. Um, now, beyond these, in these diagrams, I'm going to use a convention which also tends to highlight what are called auxiliary variables. Um, from a mathematical perspective, these are um, inessential. Uh, they simply are conveniences that allow us to capture humanly meaningful names, um, and concepts uh, associated with some of the mathematical equations. Uh, please don't view them as, as um, you know, at the same level as stocks and flows, uh, but they are very useful for communicating, um, you know, uh, some of the uh, logical structure of the system as we understand it. So, for example, to calculate a force of infection here, we might say, well, it depends on the prevalence of infection. We could, of course, just write out how the new infections depend on susceptible and infectious in terms of the parameters, you know, C times I over N times beta times uh, S. Uh, but it's often helpful 
to explicate the, the, the thinking behind the model, the, the logical structure behind it, the meaning of it, to break these out as, as uh, separate variables. Um, and you know, I'll do so here. But this is a model with three, um, for, for this component here, three uh, state equations, three, you know, a coupled set of three ODEs, and then you have this fourth one down here with cumulative, uh, cumulative illnesses. Um, these, these ones highlighted in red are kind of mathematically inessential, but humanly quite essential from my perspective. So they elevate model transparency and they enhance modifiability and often will use, you know, the total population at several places or, or what have you. So for me as a software engineer, um, they are uh, essential tools for communication with stakeholders, et cetera. We often show diagrams like this to our stakeholders and they very much benefit by understanding some of these quantities. I'm also going to use a diagrammatic convention which tends to show parameters um, on which we have some assumptions. So the recovery delay or a delay associated with loss of immunity, associated with waning of immunity or a you know, probability of discordant transmission, a, a transmission between a discordant pair, an infective and a susceptible, or the mean contacts per susceptible per year, for example. I will tend to break those out. Um, they are, again, um, nice names to refer to these quantities that otherwise could just be subsumed as a number in the equations. By breaking them out, it makes it a little bit clearer. And we'll, of course, often give these very brief names, typically in Greek letters, to, um, to express the form of the model more, more precisely. Um, uh, since this course is dealing with the, um, uh, the interface of data science and system science, I'll just note that a lot of our data science techniques focus on these quantities. And I include here initial states of the model, the initial, the initial conditions of the model. So it's like the initial population size or the initial number of people who are susceptible, infectious and recovered respectively. Um, so, um, you know, these parameters uh, are going to form a big component of, of the methods we'll talk about. We will optimize their values so that this model best accounts for patterns we observe in the population using the calibration process. We will, um, in MCMC, we'll be sampling from a joint distribution over these parameters as we do in approximate Bayesian computation, et cetera. Um, in, in many cases, we can draw parameter values uh, such as the incubation period, the time from infection to symptoms, or the latent period, the time from infection to infectiousness. Um, of a person who has been infected or the, the recovery period or infectious period, we might be able to draw those when we're lucky from reliable sources, be they meta-analyses or, or survey data or um, you know, uh, reports in the literature uh, uh, or, or other uh, findings from statistical analysis. In other cases, we will need to estimate them via other methods like uh, calibration um, or the data science methods. Okay, um, so that's a little bit about um, uh, you know the structure of the model. So I, I want to comment on on behavior, and and you know we've been talking mostly about syntax here, how we stick these things together, and I want to talk about the semantics, the meaning of these models. Um, uh, these models do have meanings, um, and uh, there's a meaning in terms of dimensions, but there's a meaning level in terms of behavior over time that's going to um, be a central point of discussion. Um, and you know, here, it's important to recognize, I think this is intuitive to everyone, but I just wanna make sure everyone's on board given the diversity of the class, that um, you know, the value of the flows dictates the evolution of the stocks over the next little bit. Um, so if we have uh, 10 people coming into our emergency room on a, excuse me, into our wards, hospital wards on a per day basis, um, you know, they will be growing the number of people in the wards over the next few days by a significant amount. Those, those numbers will be rising. Um, by contrast, the, the values of the state variables influence on an instantaneous basis, 
the uh, the values of the flows, kind of the flows now. And these two co-evolve, right? The, the, the flow is influenced by the stock and the stock's value changes based on the flow, the state variables. Um, you know, I, I think it's actually worth emphasizing uh, here um, a basic principle that people, um, uh, you know, probably intuitively feel in this group, um, but whose significance is often overlooked and, and can form the basis of some really great intuitions and in understanding the dynamics specifically of communicable diseases, um, which is, has to do with the fact that if you have a stock and it has flows in and flows out, the net flow, the sum of the flows in minus the sum of the flows out, um, uh, you know, is the key determiner of, of the, the behavior of the stock. And if that net flow is positive, if there's more coming in than there is going out, think about water shooting into your bathtub faster than it's draining, um, the, the water in the bathtub is going to rise. The, the value of the stock is going to rise. If you have more people coming into your hospital per day than are being discharged per day, um, then the number of people in the hospital will be rising. Um, if by contrast, the number coming in is on a per day basis is equal to the number leaving on a per day basis, uh, the number of people in the hospital is going to stay constant. If you're discharging more people, fat, if you're discharging them faster than you're taking them in, um, then uh, the value of the, the number of people in the hospital and then by, by extension, the value of the associated state variable stock will be dropping. And when we interpret the results of models graphically, when we see their behavior over time, when we see it in a state space plot, regardless of whether it is a compartmental model, a stock and flow model, uh, an ODE model, or regardless of whether it's a, an agent-based model, th this general idea can get you very far in reasoning why are we seeing the behavior we are. If in an agent-based model, the number of infectives is rising over, the count of people who are infectives is rising over time, even though that model is articulated at an individual level, um, you know that the number of people becoming infective is greater than the number of people recovering from infectiousness. And, and this is a very helpful um, lens through which to understand uh, the behavior and one to which we're likely to return many times uh, in this semester. Um, okay, now when we have a, when we have a model here, um, we uh, unpack the kind of syntax of these diagrams into the semantics associated with assigning to them uh, ODEs, ordinary differential equations. So each diagram is associated with a set of first order ordinary differential equations. Uh, each state variable or stock is associated with a particular element of that set. The left, left hand side, if we have a stock X, the left hand side of that equation, that element of the set of first order differential equations um, is the time derivative of that stock. So if the stock is X, it's DX DT, right? And the right-hand side of, of this equation, so we have dx dt equals something on the right that's the sum of the formulae um, uh, of, of each net, of net flow. So flows in are added to the differential on the right and flows out are subtracted, right? So if we have something like this, immigration coming in and death going out, we have the formula associated with the immigration uh, on the left, I'll, I'll just call it I, one could say I of T, um, and then the formula associated with this flow on the right. Um, and this is the rate of change of the population, uh, just to make sure we're on the same page. And this, you know, this carries over to the most complex models. We unpack the syntax into the ODEs in a straightforward way. I do want to emphasize that something that, again, I think will be tacit knowledge among most people, but a given flow here, a given transition from this state of susceptibles to this state of infectives turns into two terms in these equations, right? Um, so it, it will turn into a flow out from susceptibles, hence the minus, and a flow in to infectives, hence the plus. Um, same thing with, with this flow. Um, oh my gosh, there's an A there, a wayward A. Um, 
out out black a um this this a should be um is is problematic and should be expunged um okay and you know here's another illustration using another diagrammatic mechanism from jeff garnett um where we have um once again an illustration of kind of flows in and flows uh, flows out here um, to to a set of uh, slots or state variables. Okay, um, now I want to talk about one final building point before jumping into infectious disease modeling uh, specifics here. Okay, and specifically, I I want to talk about um, this building block, which um, receives much attention explicitly in one uh, one. Uh, sort of sub area of, of uh, dynamic modeling, namely system dynamics area. I think rightly so, it gets a lot of attention, but it tends to go kind of undiscussed in a lot of compartmental modeling. Um, I think it, it sacrifices some intuitions um, uh, to do so. And so I, I wanna just hit on it for a couple minutes. Um, when we have a, a state variable, a stock with an inflow and an outflow, which depends linearly on the value of the stock. So the value of this outflow is some constant, um, and I'll tend to write constants as alphas, uh, I mean, excuse me, as, as Greek letters. Um, uh, so it's a constant times the, the value of the stock. That's called a, a first order delay. It, it, the outflow depends linearly on the value of the stock. And oh, um, uh, it contains a balancing feedback, which um, is something of central interest within the system dynamic sphere and um, reflects the fact that it exhibits um, balancing behavior. It, it gravitates towards a balance, a state of balance, towards an equilibrium where inflow equals outflow. Um, uh, because the focus of this course lies elsewhere, I won't be driving that intuition um, quite essentially as I do is my undergrad and grad modeling courses, which are going on simultaneously in this. But it is worth noting that when we have this basic building block, which are everywhere, they're ubiquitous in infectious disease, as well as um, modeling communicable diseases, zoonoses, um, uh, environmental um, epi, et cetera. When you have this, it tends to go towards a kind of balancing situation where the inflow equals the outflow, um, where, where the rate of death is equal to the, the rate um, at which people are coming in. And, uh, and there's a reason for that. I'll, I'll refer to its dynamics in, in just another uh, minute. But um, I want to emphasize as well, and this is really important for those um, reading diagrams and parsing the ODEs, that we can phrase this um, this sort of construct in two different ways, using two different um, idioms, as it were. The first idiom is we have a certain rate or you know, hazard rate, uh, um, probability density, a temporal probability density, a chance per unit time of progressing. That's what alpha is. Alpha is not a probability. It's a probability per unit time, right? It's per day, maybe you have a 1% chance of dying. I hope not. But, um, uh, you know, or you have a 10% um, chance per day of being discharged from the hospital ward or what have you. And here, um, the flow out is, is of this form. It's, it's this times um, the value of the stock. And that, I hope you would see that that has to be the case dimensionally. Um, this parameter uh, is a probability per unit time, a probability being sort of the number of heads divided by the total number of flips of a coin is, is dimensionless. Um, it's number of coin flips that turned out heads in the numerator and number of coin flips total in the denominator, they cancel the number of coin flips. And so you get a, just a, a, a value with, with, that's, um, uh, that has, it's, as we call dimensionless or it has unit dimension is my preferred way to speak about it. It's no more dimensionless than it's something of zero length is lengthless. It has a very particular length, something of zero length is you know zero length, and a dimensionless quantity uh, just happens to be one which has a very particular and wonderful dimension, um, uh, namely it's uh, it's of unit dimension, meaning it's independent of unit system, uh, and so. 
uh, the numerator here for mortality rate is, is a unit. It's a probability per unit time and, and the, the dimension in the denominator is time. Um, and if we mu multiply it by something uh, of dimension, say people um, population, we'll get something people divided by time. In other words, people per unit time, say, um, you know, uh, uh, 100 people per, per year who are dying in this population. Um, so uh, it has to be the case that, um, uh, that we have a, uh, uh, a dimension associated with this flow that's, um, that's this, uh, this stock divided by time. And this mortality rate, this hazard rate, this temporal probability density, therefore it has to have this dimension one over time. Um, uh, so, so this formula has to be alpha times P. Um, it, it can't be anything else dimensionally. Um, by contrast, we could alternatively specify this as a mean lifetime and specify this outflow as P divided by that mean lifetime tau. Here, this parameter has dimensions time and uh, this flow again has dimensions population divided by time because the formula is P over tau, it's P divided by tau. It has to be for this flow to be this, have the same dimension as population divided by time. Um, so we can figure out how to express these, these, um, uh, these first order delays in either of these idioms as divided by a mean time or as multiplied by a, some rate. Um, uh, in either case, we will end up with the appropriate units, and you can always use the units, the associated units, to figure out, you know, what this formula is. Um, I will say that within my undergrad and grad, grad basic modeling course, you know, I, I demonstrate a conversion, I mean, a, um, a derivation that shows, you know, the mean time is, in fact, one over alpha. Um, so these two are just reciprocals of one another. Alpha is one over tau and tau is one over alpha. Um, and that can be shown through a rather nice uh, closed form integration um, in, in this case. Um, so uh, why am I emphasizing these delays? Well, a uh, couple, couple reasons. The first is they're ubiquitous uh, building blocks. Second thing is if you understand the, if you have a good intuition for them, you, you can build a good intuition for broader models very easily often. Thirdly, I wanna head off uh, dimensional problems with the outflows uh, for them. Fourthly, um, they exhibit interesting behaviors. Um, uh, I had noted that this is associated with a feedback loop, in particular a balancing or negative feedback loop. So you know, the more people that are in this stock, the more people die per year, uh, and therefore it tends to draw down the stock. Um, and, and so there's a, a feedback there. Uh, and it turns out there's a feedback when you have an inflow into it um, in terms of the balance between the two. If the inflow is greater than the outflow, it'll tend to raise the stock, which will tend to make the outflow greater until it and, it will, and the stock will continue to rise until the outflow equals the inflow. It will gravitate towards a situation where these two are imbalanced because if there's an imbalance, um, it will correct itself. If immigration is greater than death, population will rise until the two are equal. If immigration is less than death, death will drop, the population will drop, death will drop until death equals immigration and it will tend to, to, uh, to come into balance. Um, and this has a lot to do with why we see endemic equilibria for, for communicable diseases. Um, uh, endemic equilibrium where it's in some sense stable and in balance. Um, uh, in, it's in balance um, uh, there. So um, uh, I'll just say that as a dynamic behavior, if there's no flow in, we would get something like this where it would drain, it will drain faster initially because we have population times this alpha and this is larger. And so it will, the rate of change will tend to um, uh, be faster in a downwards direction, the, the minus sign here, um, if I is zero. And 
And then uh, as population gets smaller, the rate of change will be lower. So it will be pulled down less quickly. Maybe at first, where population is driving is dropping by 10 people per day. Um, maybe we have a population of 1,000, a mortality rate of 0.01 or 1%. And so we have 10 people per day dying initially. Um, and, uh, and then as population drops, it gets down to 500. We have five people per day um, uh, who are dying. And then as it drops further to 100, we have one person per day on average who's dropping. So it drops fast early and then tends to, to plateau. Um, if we have an inflow that's greater than, than zero, um, the outflow will tend to rise until it equals the inflow. Um, and um, I should have shown that, I'm sorry, I should have shown that for deaths, not cumulative deaths. But uh, in any case, um, this is a foundational building block. It's higher level than just stocks and flows, but we see it everywhere. And it's a fair thing to say that in most infectious disease models, most transitions are of this sort with one key exception. And that has to do with the communication of infection, the transmission of infection. And it is to that purpose that we will next uh, uh, apply ourselves. Um, I, and to motivate that, I would just emphasize again that a first order delay um, is a linear system. Uh, regardless of whether we phrase it in the first idiom with a chance per unit time of progressing um, or um, a, uh, in the second idiom where we have a mean time to progress, um, we have P multiplied by some constant. And again, alpha is one over tau and tau is one over alpha. So pick, pick how you wanna phrase it. Um, but um, regardless of those things, this is a linear system. Um, uh, we have an offset for, for those who are mathematically inclined, you'll recognize that um, we can do a substitution of variables and actually eliminate um, this I here. Uh, so um, uh, the fact is we have a linear system here and we, where we are going is into the nonlinear regime. Um, we're, we're going to be dealing with nonlinear systems for almost all of this course because we are dealing with communicable disease models. So 